That's important. The Bible tells us this in Romans chapter 4, verse 21, 14, 21. He says, It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Amen? Even if you don't think it's a sin, it's still a weight. It's still a ter ter terrible testimony. And I believe the Bible teaches abstinence. The Bible states this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Let us therefore, and he's talking about the end times, that we are to be alert, awake, light. He says, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be what? Sober. Some people say, well, that means to be this and that, whatever. Listen, the context there, he's talking about, that word sober there actually means not to be close to, not to be beside. Okay, what's he talking about? The next verse gives the interpretation. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. The soberness there is talking about drinking. He says, don't even stand beside it. Stay away from that stuff. And that is abstinence. Amen? Amen. That's not very good amen, but that's okay. Now, where, where biblical grace, good grace, you see, bad grace, abusive grace, keeps the believer as close to the edge of sin as they possibly can, pure grace keeps us as close to God as we possibly can. Amen? And that's what God wants from all of us. You see, God's grace is not a license to do what we want to do. But it's the freedom, the liberty, to be able to do what we should do. Uh, I, I've told a story before about the Muslim kid. He became a believer in Christ. And he came to the States to be educated. At college, he wouldn't eat pork. And some of the, the students there, you know, they're studying the Bible and everything. They say, hey, we have freedom, liberty, in Christ. You, can, you know, there's nothing unclean. You can eat any meat you want to. He said, I know that. He said, but every time I go home, my father asks me, have I eaten any of that pork yet? Now, I know I have freedom and liberty to eat that, but yet I know that it will stop and block the opportunity for my father to ever hear me witness to him. And so because of liberty and love, I give up. Even though I know there's nothing wrong, I give up as a testimony to my father. 1 Corinthians 8 9, Paul comments about that. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. He says in verse 13, he says this, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Yes, I do have freedom and liberty to do certain things, but they're not the best things to do because it hurts people. It's a terrible testimony to them. And so out of love, I give up even that right. I believe that's freedom and liberty in Jesus Christ. You know, they, they always cry about legalism, and I don't want legalism. Legalism is putting extra biblical rules personal preferences and opinions, list of requirements and rules for believers' conduct, forcing obedience in order to be holy, in order to be accepted by God. We know that's not true. We're always accepted by God. We're always loved by God because we're accepted in His Son. Amen? We, we know that. But legalism does suck the very life out of a person's heart. Amen? Legalism is this here. It's forcing a person's personal preferences and opinions to become your convictions. <laughs> and I believe that's a good definition. But because we don't like legalism, that doesn't mean I go all the way to the other side of the pendulum and I have license in my life. You see, as a leader, it's our right, it's our obligation to the Lord to persuade, to encourage believers and members to follow clear godliness for their behavior as outlined in the Scriptures. And if I'm not mistaken, I have read, not only in the Old Testament but the New Testament, be holy, for I am holy. It states in Ephesians 5.3, he says this here, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be once let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Stay away, be holy. 
You see, the problem is in our response to legalism, in our reaction to legalism, in our reaction to denominational tradition, in our reaction to spiritual authority. A lot of Christians have embraced bad grace that denies any standard of behavior for their life for believers. It seems like today everything is up for questioning, isn't it? Everybody wants to question everything today. And their cry is this here, freedom, liberty in Jesus Christ. And so these grace abusers, when we say living holy, morally, above reproach, serving Christ, stewardship, responsibility to God, to their church, to their leaders, to areas of holiness over their life. Those things are sidestepped by these people. They're refused, defiant against, because those things that say you ought to live this way, they are viewed as doing away with grace. And they say to us, listen, you're forcing us under the law again. You're forcing us under legalism. You see, to them, the law and legalism, it means I don't have to look over my shoulders and having somebody trying to legislate the law or rules to judge my life by it. I'm under grace. And when that legalism and when those rules brings about a negative message to me like thou shalt not or thou shalt or holy living, it does not apply to me. That's what they say. Paul says this in Romans 6, 14. He says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And boy, they'll grab that verse they say, see? Now let me say something. He says in the very next verse, he says in verse uh, 15, What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? What? God forbid. Amen. That's the next verse. And the previous verses to that verse, verses 11 through 13, says this here. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he says, let not, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. And then he says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members and instruments of righteousness unto God. That's what he wants from us. It states in verse 19, he goes on and comments, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to what? Don't live like you used to live. You're different. You're a child of God. You're dead in Christ, and you're alive in Christ through his resurrection. Amen? And then he states in verse 22, he says this here, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto what? Holiness and the end everlasting life. Amen? You see, grace frees us to be what God wants us to be. Now, don't miss this. Grace frees us to serve a new master, and his name is Christ. Let me say that again. Grace frees us to serve a new master, but no master. Some people don't want any master over their life. But if you're saved, your master is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Don't forget this. A lot of people say the law, the law, like the law is something terrible. It states in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, he says this, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. You see, the law shows us where we're wrong. Verse 12 says this here, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Why would we not want to be, in a sense, want to follow some of the things of law that point us toward holiness? Never to be accepted, using it to be accepted to God. We're already accepted, 
But the law is not something that's dirty, that's unkind, by the way. Amen? You see, they say this, well, wait a minute, I'm free from the law. I'm free from legalism. Why should I have any kind of authority over my life? Why do I have to obey commands and His Word? And they even then begin to try to reinterpret the Scriptures that will go along with their licensed living. And I've seen that happen quite often. Listen, there's a reason God puts certain boundaries for our life. And here's the reason. We have within us a sinful nature. We're all part of a fallen race. And our bent, our natural response is to do wrong. We have a problem. It states in Romans chapter 7, verse 21 and following, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Anybody feel like that? For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And then he says, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You see, Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, you know, that's what I, I do that exactly. Because with inside of me, there is a fallen nature, a sinful principle that automatically wants to do wrong. And so God gives us boundaries so that we don't have to yield to that wrong within our life. Amen? You see, because of that fallen nature, the lost person, they lean toward doing awful things that are wrong. But the believer, you know what he leans to? He still has a fallen nature. He leans to legalism or license. That's what they go toward every time. Let me say this to you. Both of those are wrong, right? Legalism, license, they're both wrong. They're both sin. True grace allows us to lovingly want to follow God's word and his ways. And when I'm following God's word and his ways, that in turn helps me to break my old sinful habits because now I'm putting on godly habits. The more I follow him, the more holy and godly I become like him. Amen? Romans 7.25 says this here. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when with mine I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And he goes on to state, what can give me the victory? And what is it? The Lord Jesus Christ. He states in Ephesians 4.22 and following, that you put off concerning the former conversation or your old behavior, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Begin to look at your life God's way. That you put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I'm to put off my old sinful practices and I am to put on new holiness and righteousness with my life. Not license, but holiness. Amen? You see, true grace allows us to understand that we have been purchased. We have been delivered from our slave masters. Our slave masters were sin and Satan. And we've been delivered from that in our life. Amen? And let me say something. Our wanting to live holy and go all out for God. We have freedom, liberty in Christ. Yes, we do. But it's not our payment for our freedom. The reason we do these things is not paying for our freedom. The reason we do those things is because it's our gratitude, our gratefulness for what God has done for us, that he picked us up out of the mire and the muck, and he put our feet up on the rock of Jesus Christ. He has so transformed our lives. And so the reason I want to go and do my very best for him and be as holy as I possibly can and not be questioned with rudiments of the world and the things of the world and sin is because I love him so much I'm so grateful for him rescuing me one day. And if you've been saved, that's for you too. That's part of the salvation deal. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. I'm just about done. Listen to this. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are what? You don't own yourself if you've been saved. He says in the next verse, for you are bought with a price. Since that, what? Therefore, 
Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 2 Timothy 2.21 says this here. If a man therefore purge himself from these sins, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. The more I try to live for God, the more of a vessel of honor I will be, and the more God wants to use me. That's for every child of God. And so if it's sin, away with it. If it's questionable, away with it. If it's a weight, away with it. All the way for Jesus Christ because we want to be vessels of honor. Amen? It used to be, you used to have the little wrist that says uh, WWJD, you know, what would Jesus do? Remember that? And then after a while, the power of that message was lost. But it's a great message. Galatians 2.20 says this here. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That means now I want my life to live as if Christ is living his life through me. What would Jesus do? That's how I handle life. That's how we are to handle life, right? He states this in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? In our bodies. God, since we died to ourselves, we're trying to allow his life to live through us so we begin to talk like, we begin to think like, we begin to act like Jesus Christ. He says, 2 Corinthians 5.15, he says this, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He says in Romans 12.1, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 